Welcome, everyone. Uh, I wanted to bring to the podium to, uh, someone to introduce this afternoon's speaker. This person is uh, already familiar to you uh, as our conference uh, coordinator, and she's done a, a fabulous uh, job, but we won't thank her uh, for that now. Uh, I did want to uh, tell you how we mostly know her. She is uh, one of uh, the graduate students uh, in our MFA program, and she uh, has uh, this past year won our more prestigious awards, uh, first the Steinbeck Award in Writing, and also the Sarah Tucker Award in uh, Fiction. She is actively publishing. She's a, a wonderful uh, writer and a wonderful friend, and we love her very much. Uh, please uh, welcome Mary Weiss. It was uh, June of 1994, and I was on a plane flying from New York to Los Angeles. I settled into my aisle seat with the new Esquire magazine. It was the Women We Love issue, and I had purchased it because the lead article was Norman Mailer's interview with Madonna. Halfway through the second paragraph, I bashed my elbow on the beverage cart and fainted. I came to, slumped over my seat, and then spent 10 minutes convincing the bevy of steward eye that I was fine. I picked up the magazine from the floor and found it open to an excerpt from Prozac Nation written by Elizabeth Wurzel. I was dehydrated and nauseous and slightly mortified at having fainted, but I read that excerpt over and over again. To say that I was blown away would be an incredible understatement. I had never read anything quite like it. It was full of humor and tragedy and dysfunction and truth. Two months later, I bought Prozac Nation the day it hit bookstores. I read it and then immediately reread it. I was amazed, enthralled actually, at the level of truth. Never before had I read anything so searingly honest. F. Scott Fitzgerald said that an author ought to write for the youth of its generation, and this is exactly what Elizabeth does so well. She's a woman of our generation, and that is one that is continuing the feminist movement with both sincerity and honesty. She's bold and brave and beautiful, and she makes no apologies for who she is. Elizabeth stands behind what she writes, which isn't always easy to do, considering she routinely gets the crap beaten out of her by the press. <laughs> Elizabeth is the author of the best-selling books Prozac Nation and Bitch in Praise of Difficult Women. She graduated from Harvard, where she received the 1986 Rolling Stone College Journalism Award for essay writing. She was the popular music critic for The New Yorker and New York Magazine. Her most recent book, More Now Again, chronicles her battle with and eventual conquest of drug addiction. People tend to dismiss Elizabeth as the hot chick who writes about depression and drug addiction, though neither of these topics are the least bit unimportant, and it should be noted, Prozac Nation was perhaps the book that finally forced people all over the world to recognize depression for what it is. Elizabeth has an unbelievable knack for writing the simple truth and writing it in such a way that you're impressed and jealous at the same time. There's an amazing line in More Now Again that perfectly exemplifies this talent. At the end of a paragraph in which she discusses her relationship with her mother, she writes, quote, I am the person that my mother is closest with in the world, and vice versa, I sometimes think, and she does not know me at all, end quote. Maybe it's a Jewish thing, but this line describes virtually every mother-daughter relationship I know of. People often, throw the word, people often throw the word brilliant around. It is woefully overused. But in the case of Elizabeth, I think it is totally appropriate. She is disgustingly well-read, and her knowledge of current events, history, and literary references is flabbergasting. Two pages into Bitch, I started writing down all the words I didn't know the definitions of. By the time I finished the book, I had 10 pages of vocabulary words. I looked them all up and used the list to study for the GRE. The, li the literary world needs Elizabeth Wurzel. The world at large needs Elizabeth Wurzel, not only because she's a talented, prolific female writer with something to say, but also because she's a truth teller, and there are too few writers who are willing to share their truths with others. I consider it a huge honor to have gotten to know Elizabeth over the past few months, and I'm proud to introduce her. Please welcome Elizabeth Wurzel. Wow, that was really nice. Um, thank you. Um, actually, and everyone here has been so nice, so thank you all for, um, well, for having me and being nice. Um, I, wait, I'm just grabbing this water. Um, 
I couldn't decide. I haven't read anything from um, Prozac Nation in a very long time, and I thought, well, maybe I'll read something from it. Um, but at, I actually sort of felt like, well, I'll, I'll take a vote maybe. Does, does anyone have an opinion about this? Or I, or the, I mean, I was going to try to read a little bit from that and a little bit from the new book. Oh, okay, that sounds good. Um, and then, then I even got with the <laughs> with the new book. Um, I was confused because there's a section that I read a lot, which was about um, a shoplifting incident, which I really liked reading because I, I I thought it was funny, and also the whole Winona Ryder thing was going on. Um, was at its peak at the point um, when the book came out. Um, but then there's also was another section that I read from occasionally, which was very much about the publishing world run amok, which had to do with my moving into Doubleday's offices uh, to finish writing my book while I was planning to go to rehab. And I thought, well, maybe in this situation that would be... Um, more appropriate. Okay, so maybe I'll just I'll read that. Um, but anyway, I, I wanted to say just by the way, um, having to do with um, what we were talking about yesterday on the panel and about um, uh, writers, it, I, I think mostly um, we were talking about writers who don't like going on tours or don't like making public presentations and how you know, here are these people who were shy and retiring and they thought finally they could, you know, find some way to do what they do and not be bothered. And um, I felt somehow in inclined to point out, and I wish I'd thought of this yesterday, that really the great confessional poets of this century, um, and we're talking about, you know, like Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, Robert Lowell, they were all great readers. They did great readings. Um, and there's a very good record of their work in that you can, you know, get, you know, audio versions of them reading. And um, they were also, I mean, in Anne Sexton's case, she was, you know, absolutely beautiful. Um, in Sylvia Plath's case, I mean, she was striking and kind of interesting looking, but, um, I, I don't know that they're related, but I, I do think it's possible that the ability to um, to be forthright about how, how you're feeling um, might have something to do with being able to, you know, stand, not just write in public, but stand in public and, and say it. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't prove this, and I have to say I, had, I really hadn't given it all that much thought until I was thinking about this last night. But um, the idea that um, writers with public personalities is some new invention um, is just crazy uh, and wrong. Um, and in fact, at a time when people read a lot more, I mean, people read a lot less now than they did in, say, the 50s. Um, uh, writers were um, probably, you know, had, had, were much more, um, you know, had, had much more strong public personalities. I think one of the reasons that that went away is, um, you know, the need for confessional poetry was replaced by, uh, by rock and roll. I mean, really, once you have, like, Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan, you really don't need Anne Sexton. I, I, maybe you do, but I'm, I'm saying, you know, that, that put it in a much more accessible place. But, um, you know, anyway, the idea that somehow it corrupts the process, that there are writers who are good, um, good at... at doing a public presentation is, um, as I said, stupid. But I also think, um, I, I think it, I think in some ways um, it's part of what makes the writing good is some ability to, to be able to do that. I, I, I think you can't be fantastically shy and also able to be very honest even on the page. 
and as I said, I can't prove this, but, but uh, you know, uh, those examples, I think, sort of bear it out. Um, anyway, um, so the thing I was going to read from, um, from Prozac Nation, I, uh, um, I hope I didn't sound just defensive, but I, I, I did stop and think about this. I could go on and say mean things about other writers, and then I would start to sound defensive. But, um, um, but I would be, um, and actually, maybe I'll do that at some point too. But, um, <laughs> but um, I, I just actually was recently, uh, you know, I guess Bruce Springsteen's new album is coming out next week, and um, I was listening to his first album, which has the song "For You" on it which I think is, is very botched by being overproduced. And um, I have a bootleg of it when it's, where it's just, a, just piano and him singing. And if you don't know the song, there's kind of no way to explain this, but it's a very sad song. And on his first album, it's, well, it's overproduced. And uh, it really is meant to be just him and a piano. Um, and this section was about I was at summer camp when I was 13 and uh, I was sitting with a friend and listening to this song and because I was just listening to the album I, I looked at this again and I haven't looked at this book in a long time and I looked at it and I thought oh that's that wasn't so bad I mean I, I thought well, it was like kind of I could still read this and think um, it, it still sounds like something I might write now so um, maybe I'll, I'll read it so um, here it is um, that summer, I am just 13, everything sucks, and I am stuck at camp wondering about the Olympics. One day, right after cleanup period, right after our beds, and it must have been 1980, by the way, um, right after our beds have been inspected for hospital corners and our cubbies have been checked to make sure all the Archie comics are piled neatly, I sit on the porch of my bunk listening to Bruce Springsteen's first album. Paris, a girl I also go to school with, that really is her name, um, comes outside to sit with me. Paris is, I guess, what I would call a friend. I've known her since kindergarten, and like everyone else who's been in my life for a while, she's just kind of waiting for me to snap out of this funk so that we can have play dates and polish our nails in baby pink like we used to do when we were seven. She lives across the street from me, so we still walk home from school together sometimes, which can't be any fun for her because all I want to talk about is the oncoming apocalypse in my brain. Paris tries to be understanding. I don't make this process very easy for people. After weeks of haranguing the girls in my bunk about the genius of Bruce Springsteen, when they finally say they're getting to like to borrow tapes or make requests to hear Born to Run, I just start yelling that they're all a bunch of unoriginal copycats and Bruce belongs to me alone. I make them swear that if they ever meet anyone new and claim to like any Springsteen songs, they'll remember to footnote me. And they all throw up their hands and say, look, we're trying. So Paris comes and sits down beside me, and I make her a little nervous when I tell her that she's got to listen to this song called For You. She's afraid I'll be cross if she doesn't like it, or even worse, that I'll be really furious if she does. I explain that the song is about a girl just like me who kills herself. We listen to the first verse, to the cryptic lines about a girl's fading presence, about borrow my shine vacancy, about someone whose grip on life is so vague that to see her you have to look hard. That's me, I say to Paris. I'm the girl who is lost in space, the girl who is disappearing always, forever fading away and receding farther and farther into the background. Just like the Cheshire Cat, someday I will suddenly leave, but the artificial warmth of my smile, that phony, clownish curve, the kind you see on miserably sad people and villains in Disney movies, will remain behind as an ironic remnant. I'm the girl you see in the photo photograph from some party someplace or some picnic in the park, the one who looks so very vibrant and shimmery, but who is in fact soon going to be gone. When you look at that picture again, I want to assure you I will no longer be there. I'll be erased from history, like a traitor in the Soviet Union. Because with every day that goes by, I feel myself becoming more and more invisible, getting covered over more and more thickly with darkness, coats and coats of darkness that are going to suffocate me in the sweltering heat of the summer sun that I can't even see anymore, even though I can feel it burn. Imagine, I suggest to Paris, only knowing that the sun is shining because you feel the ache of its awful heat and not because you know the joy of its life of its light. 
Imagine being always in the dark. I'm going on and on this way to Paris, who is still uneasy and is not quite sure what to say. You know, I continue, I'd be just like the girl in the song except for one thing. One thing. And that's that he says she's all he ever wanted. He loves her so much. The whole song is about how he's come to take her to the hospital to rescue her from suicide. I start as if on cue to cry. I am so caught up in the idea that nobody would actually try to save me if I were to slip my wrists or hang myself from one of the rafters in the bunk. I can't believe anyone might care enough to try to keep me alive. And then I realize that, yes, of course they would, but only because it's the thing to do. It's not about true caring, it's about not wanting to live with the guilt, the insult, the ugly knowledge that a suicide took place and you did nothing. Once I make a suicidal gesture, then everyone indeed will come running because my problems leave the realm of the difficult work-a-day, let's talk it through stuff, and I become an actual medical emergency. I will qualify as a trauma case that Aetna or MetLife or whichever insurance carrier I've got will actually cover. Actually, that is no longer true. Um, they'll pump my stomach, stitch my wrists, apply cold packs to the bruises on my neck, do whatever it is they have to do to keep me alive, and then the heavy-duty, institutional-sized mental health professionals take over. But day after day of depression, the kind that doesn't seem to merit carting me off to a hospital but allows me to sit here on this stoop in summer camp as if I were normal, day after day wearing down everybody who gets near me, my behavior seems somehow not acute enough for them to know what to do with me, though I'm just enough of a mess to be driving everyone around me crazy. I cry some more and go on and on about how nice it must be to have someone so in love with you they'd sing about the day you died. Paris opens her mouth probably to say something about how people would like to help me, people would like to let me know they care, they just don't know what to do, but I shut her up. I don't want to hear the company line right now. And if anyone ever loved me enough to write such a beautiful song about me, you know I wouldn't kill myself, I continue. In the end, I have to think the girl in For You is totally crazy because she decided to die when there was so much love for her right here on Earth. Yes, Paris says, talking to me only to offer the comfort of a human voice, not because she can say anything that will make a difference. I see what you mean. Oh, Paris, I cry some more. No one is ever going to love me that way because I'm so awful and all I ever do is cry and get depressed. If I were another person, I'd go on, I wouldn't want to deal with me. I don't want to deal with me. It's so hopeless. I want out of this life. I really do. I keep thinking that if I could just get a grip on myself, I could be all right again. I keep thinking that I'm driving myself crazy, but I swear, I swear to God, I have no control. It's so awful. It's like demons have taken over my mind, and nobody believes me. Everybody thinks I could be better if I wanted to. But I can't be the old Lizzie anymore. I can't be myself anymore. I mean, Actually, I am being myself right now, and it's so horrible. Paris puts her arms around me and hugs me. Lizzie, everyone likes you fine just the way you are, she says, because that's what people say in these situations. I sit there with my face in my hands as if to catch my head to keep it from falling off and rolling across girls' campus like a soccer ball that someone might kick by accident. Um, anyway, I, I, uh, it's funny, I read that now and um, it seems um, well, well it seems so ex well ex I don't know if extreme is the word but the, the thing about it that is true is that if you've ever been depressed that really is exactly how it feels huh so um, I'm, I'm glad I mostly don't feel that way anymore um, uh, the, the other part of the book that I, I actually did read a lot when I used to read from this book um, was something about the distinction between um, depression and madness. And um, it, it had a lot to do with, um, I kind of almost think the visuals, like the exciting idea of madness versus the actual misery of depression itself. Um, or, you know, the artistic idea of madness versus the, like, down in the dumps kind of reality of depression, which is not artistic at all, which is just lying in bed, not being able to do a thing. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to just read that passage, and then I'll uh, 
move on to the new thing. Um, anyway, I have studiously tried to avoid ever using the word madness to describe my condition. Now and again, the word slips out, but I hate it. Madness is too glamorous a term to convey what happens to most people who are losing their minds. That word is too exciting, too literary, too interesting in its connotations to convey the boredom, the slowness, the dreariness, the dampness of depression. You associate madness with Zelda Fitzgerald and all her rich, gorgeous, cerebral disturbedness, or maybe you think of it as something that members of Aureliano Buendia's family sank into at the incestuous end of 100 years of solitude. Madness is something of the fiery hot tempers of Latin America or the Deep South, of Borges and Cortezar, or William Faulkner and Tennessee Williams. Madness is delightful to the beholder, scary in its way but still fun to watch, a sport for spectators and rubberneckers who can't avert their eyes from the awfulness that they know they shouldn't be seeing. Madness is Jim Morrison swinging suggestively out of the 15th floor window of his suite in the Chateau Marmont. It's Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton duking it out through the cramped camera angles of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It's Edie Sedgwick and all her anemic, anorexic beauty trying to do herself in with amphetamines and pearls and while dancing on the table at Ondine and posing for Vogue as a youth Quaker. It's Kurt Cobain in every one of those Nirvana videos looking like a man who is sick deeply sick, who needs help badly and wears his desperation like a badge of cool. It's Robert Mitchum with his tattooed knuckles preaching and ranting in the night of the hunter. It's Pete, it's Pete Townsend smashing his perfectly good guitar to bits and pieces. It's every great moment in rock and roll and it's probably every great moment in popular culture. But depression is pure dullness, tedium straight up. Depression is, especially these days, an overused term to be sure, but never one associated with anything wild, anything about dancing all night with a lampshade on your head and then going home and killing yourself. The elegance and beauty and romance of Cho Cho San as she bleeds to death in Madame Butterfly, or of the double suicide in Romeo and Juliet, that is the domain of madness alone. The word madness allows its users to celebrate the pain of its sufferers to forget that underneath all the acting out and quests for fabulousness and fine poetry, there is a person in huge amounts of dull, ugly agony. Why must every literary examination of Robert Lowell, of John Berryman, of Anne Sexton, of Jean Stafford, of so many writers and artists, keep perpetuating the notion that their individual pieces of genius were the result of madness? While it may be true that a great deal of art finds its inspirational wellspring in sorrow, Let's not kid ourselves about how much time each of those people wasted and lost by being mired in misery. So many productive hours slipped by as paralyzing despair took over. None of these people wrote during depressive episodes. If they were manic depressives, they worked during hypomania, the productive precursor to a manic phase, which allows a peak of creative energy to flow. If they were garden variety unipolar depressives, they created during their periods of reprieve. This is not to say that we should deny sadness its rightful place among the muses of poetry and of all art forms, but let's stop calling it madness. Let's stop pretending that the feeling itself is interesting. Let's call it depression and admit that it's very bleak. Sure, madness draws crowds, sells tickets, keeps the National Enquirer in business, yet so many depressives suffer in silence without anyone knowing. Their plight somehow invisible until they adopt the antics of madness that are impossible to ignore. Depression is such an uncharismatic disease, so much the opposite of the lively vibrance that one associates with madness. Forget about the scant hours in her brief life when Sylvia Plath was able to produce the works in Ariel. Forget about that tiny bit of time and just remember the days that spanned into years when she could not move, couldn't think straight, could only lie in wait in a hospital bed hoping for the relief that con electroconvulsive therapy would bring. Don't think of the striking on-screen picture, the mental movie you create of the pretty young woman being wheeled on the gurney to get her shock treatments. And don't think of the psychedelic photonegative image of the same woman at the moment she receives that a bolt of electricity. Think instead of the girl herself, of the way she must have felt right then, of the way no amount of great poetry and fascination and fame could make the pain she felt at that moment worth suffering. 
Remember that when you're at the point at which you're doing something as desperate and violent as sticking your head in an oven, it is only because the life that preceded this act felt even worse. Think about living in depression from moment to moment and know it is not worth any of the great art that comes as its byproduct. Um. Oh, thank, uh, thank you. Um, should, um, do I, since you applauded, do you want me to stop there, or should I read read from? Okay. I thought. Um, okay, I'll. Um, I will now um, move on uh, to this book um, more now again, which um, came out. I don't know a few months ago, I guess. Um, and uh, was about um, uh, drug addiction. And uh, I guess after uh, the happy ending of uh, having gotten through uh, depression, um, I ended up later uh, getting addicted to, um, embarrassingly enough, Ritalin. Um, well, and I guess other things. Um, and. Uh, I have to say, I, I, I really um, think after this, I, I've had quite enough of writing about um, how, um, how I'm, uh, various ways that I'm falling apart, because um, I, I don't really think I am at this point. But, um, um, but strangely, I, I think this is an entertaining story, more than I thought Prozac Nation was an entertaining story, because actually, Drug addiction is more of an activity, like more happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you, you do things and, you know, it tends to involve other people and you tend to make other people's lives really awful and, you know, I, you know, well, anyway, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, uh, what can I say? I'll, I'll just read. Um, I, I uh, always have started by reading the preface just because um, it sort of, uh, you know, puts uh, the story in, in perspective. And um, then I'll, I'll read about um, living in the offices of, uh, of Doubleday in the Bertelsmann Building on 44th Street and Broadway in New York City. Um, anyway, um, so here it begins. Uh, there are no seasons in Florida. People say that about other places. They say that about Southern California, but I've lived through some freezing nights in Los Angeles. I've snuck around people's homes there and turned the thermostat up to 80 degrees because I've been so cold, especially in the canyons. But here in Florida, the ground is flat, the terrain is absolute, it is always warm, it is always bright, the Christmas lights strung on the houses along the highway look ridiculous. Today there was a tornado in Miami. They showed the twister in the skyscrapers on the evening news. No one was hurt. The only way I can tell the passage of time is how long I can go between pills. Five minutes, maybe. It used to be longer, 15 minutes, a half hour. But that was months ago, or maybe weeks. Time passes slowly, or too fast, or it makes no difference. I crush up my pills and snort them like dust. They are my sugar. They are the sweetness in the days that have none. They drip through me like Tupelo honey. Then they are gone. Then I need more. I always need more. For all of my life, I have needed more. My pills are methylphenidate hydrochloride, brand name Ritalin, but I will take Dexedrine or any other kind of prescription amphetamine that I can get. I used to swallow them, 10 milligrams at a time, every four hours, no more than three times a day, as directed by my physician. Then I took more, and more often. Then one day, I cut one in half, trying to extend the supply, and some powder crumbled off of my uneven slice. I could feel my face light up. I might as well have been Columbus discovering America while looking for India. I snorted it up as if it were cocaine, and something different happened in my brain, a scratchy rush. Since then, I've been crushing them up like that on purpose. I inhale 40 pills a day. 
That's how I spend my days. I smash up powder and make it go away. Right now I live in an efficiency behind the Galleria Mall off Sunrise Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale. This is like some cosmic joke. This whole setup is like a picture on a poster that says this is your brain on drugs. If you knew me, if you saw me in my apartment in Greenwich Village, you would never believe this. No one believes this. Like most stories that involve large quantities of drugs, this one is shaped by incongruous details. I'm a New Yorker. I am not equipped to live anywhere else. I do not have a driver's license. I cannot safely get behind the wheel of an automobile. And here I am in a place without sidewalks. This is not the first place I've lived down here. There was also my mother's condominium on the Intracoastal, which was white and beautiful with hard western sunlight in the afternoons. There was the Schubert Motel, owned by French Canadians, with a broken air conditioner, so the cuts I hacked onto my legs festered from the humidity. When I went to the emergency room, I told them it was from shaving with a dull razor, which I think they might have believed. The residents on their 36-hour shifts had such a soft innocence. Then there was the Riverside Hotel on Las Olas Boulevard with red velvet wallpaper and 24-hour room service. This apartment comes furnished. I have a Murphy bed and a kitchen table and one of those desks that is part of the same wall unit as the bed. I have local phone service and an answering machine. I don't have a calling card, so I can't return long-distance calls, which is why I don't. The entrance is off a catwalk. Down the hall are two call girls, and next door on the other side are two gay flight attendants who work for a charter airline used by hockey teams. Downstairs is a paralegal with a cat who isn't very friendly. This is even more ridiculous because it's Florida. I mean, hockey, well, anyway. I, I know how I got here. I know how I found this apartment. I remember the ad in the Sun Sentinel, and still I can tell you I don't know how I got here. My life in all its apparent disorder has always been so carefully planned, always just as it was meant to be. In my college recommendation, my high school English teacher said that he could see me growing up and writing for The New Yorker. So I graduated from college and started writing for The New Yorker. I've always had the gift of making it all look like some big lucky accident, like whoops, here I landed, gee whiz, what do you know? But it's all been so deliberate. I am exactly who you thought I would be. I am the least surprising person you will ever meet. But not this. This is really an accident. There are no extremes of poverty or wealth to speak of here. There are strip malls and a housing complex with a swimming pool that no one ever uses. I sit at a raw bar and eat oysters, or I make copies late at night at Kinko's, and when there is a Clinique bonus, I buy a new lipstick at Burdine's. Everyone here is transient or retired, or sometimes there are college students visiting during spring break. No one here has a last name. This is surely the most anonymous place I could ever be. If I tried to tell my neighbors about my life in New York or my work or my friends, they would not care. If it's not of immediate use to them, if it's not about borrowing detergent or a ride to the supermarket, they don't hear it. They're the nicest people, but it's all about the next five minutes. And by now, my whole life is about the next five minutes. There are no human beings in this story, not really. That's my favorite thing about my pills. They are my only relationship. The only thing I care about is where more will come from. That is all I need to worry about. Otherwise, I might not exist. I am in a place where there is no difference between May and December, and the only time that matters is the minutes between pills when all I think about is my next line. When nothing else happens all day, when all there is to show for it is some work I've done or an okay movie I've seen, when it's been nothing special, they are my treat. They used to be a treat. Late at night, they were something to look forward to. I could tell myself, I can still get high. I would tell myself, this is the sugar in my bowl. But now it's my life. Pills are my everything. At the end of the day, other people ask themselves, is this all there is? I don't want to wait for the answer. I'm not stupid. I don't wait to see if today will be better than yesterday, because I already know. And these pills are deep inside of me. What person could ever get this close? Who would want to? And I swear to you, and I don't care how this sounds, I think it's love. If you don't understand, you don't know what love is. Um, Okay, so, um, so, um, 
Well, uh, wow, that sounds horrible, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> um, so just to um, bring this um, up to where I was going to uh, read from, I, I stayed in Florida for a year. I, was, I went there for two weeks to get started writing um, my second book, which is, um, which is Bitch, um, which I haven't read from, though I, I, I like it and I like reading from it for some reason. I just didn't feel like it. But um, anyway, I'm, I meant to be there for like two weeks to just you know, get going on the process, and I ended up staying for a year because of this. And um, I realized somewhere in there that I had a problem with, with drugs. It was not like this, uh, I failed to notice this. And um, I planned when I got back to get help, but not until I finished my book. And I mean, this is, with a speed freak, this is very hard because Speed freaks, as like my joke is that you could water a plant for 24 hours. I mean, it's like just everything is, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, at a certain point thought like, you know, once again, this is, I was joking with my editor, like that the, the perfect semicolon could change the whole meaning of the book. And I just couldn't, she could not get pages out of my hands. I really had, you know, and I had an elaborate, system of markers in different colors and post-its in different colors that meant different things to me. And she even figured out what they meant, which is she's an amazing, amazing person. She actually was my editor. She's now my agent, because you, you don't lose a person who can understand your color-coded system. <laughs> when, um, I mean, th this is, you know, this, this takes, this takes a, a rare person. Um, and so, Anyway, this was just going on and on, and I was just, I, I really needed to get help. Um, at a, by the time I got to New York, I was no longer able to get Ritalin from the various sources that I got it from, which were somewhat legitimate. So I had switched to cocaine, which is the same thing, by the way. Any of you who have kids who are on Ritalin, like, just imagine giving them cocaine pills. It's the same thing. Um, and I... Um, I mean, I, 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 at any rate, snorting it is the same thing. So I, um, and, you know, it just, this had to stop. And eventually, you know, my editor said, well, why don't we let you have an, this empty office here? One of the publishers is on leave, and you can have this really nice office, and you'll just work in here, and you'll just hand me pages as they get finished and you know and you'll finish your book and then you can check into the hospital and you know this became like I, I mean no one the only reason I know I'm not lying about this is that my editor actually wrote a book um, for writers which I really recommend called The Forest for the Trees her name is Betsy Lerner and and in it she describes this situation so I know I'm not making this up. Because I have thought to myself, I must be kidding. And, and, you know, she swears that no. And then I thought maybe we're in a joint lie, like it's like become this, you know, folly a deux, because we're both, we've both lost our minds. But then others have confirmed that this is all true. So anyway, I'll just read about this. And um, here is what happened. Um, so Betsy is my editor when I refer to Betsy. And, um, the, um, I'm referring to cousins of mine who come visit. Um, and I had, prior to that, been living in hotels because I was scared of my apartment. I thought, I, I don't know what I thought my apartment was going to do to me, something bad. But um, I, anyway, um, Wandy and Lewis and the girls come to New York for Thanksgiving. I decide to try staying in my own apartment for a few days since my house sitter is going home to the suburbs of Boston, and well, why not? With enough coke, I can probably handle it. The girls want to come and see where I live and meet my cat, so it seems like the least I can do is be there. By Saturday, I can't stand it. There's no way I'm getting any work done here. All the coke in the world can't change that in my own apartment, in the sight of my life before Florida, I feel like hell. I don't mean that I feel hellish. I actually feel like hell itself, like that Robert Lowell poem where he says, I myself am hell. I have to get out of here. I have too much work to do to cope with feelings. 
I'd been coming in and working at Doubleday's offices on occasion because the hotel was so close by and it became convenient. One of the associate publishers is on leave, and in the interest of getting the book done, Betsy has let me write there sometimes so that I can hand her pages as quickly as I can write them and as quickly as my HP Portable can print them out. And right now, it's Saturday night. Almost everyone I know is out of town, home for the holidays. There is nothing to do but work. I grab my computer and leave the apartment and walk out into the evening dark. I hate how it gets so dark so early this time of year. I miss Florida and its perennial warmth. I take a taxi up to Doubleday headquarters on 45th Street and Broadway. Somehow I convince the security guard that he needs to let me up into the office, that he needs to give me the pass key, bless you, uh, to get into the glass doors at reception. I tell him it is urgent and emergency. I'm an author, my book is due, my notes are upstairs, and he's got to let me in. Please, 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 and for some reason, maybe because I am obviously desperate, he does. I am settling in here to write my book, and I'm not leaving until it happens. That's it. I'm settling in. This is not quite a plan. I don't know what I am doing. I don't say to myself, this is my new home. But somehow I know that I will not sleep until I am finished, and I will not finish my book anywhere but here. The stark office lights, their fluorescent discomfort, this is where I belong. There is a day bed next to a big, huge picture window, so I can nap if I want to. I can go home to change clothes and shower and feed the cat every couple of days, but otherwise I have no reason to be anywhere else. There are coffee and tea in the kitchenette, and in one of the drawers of the desk I find something that looks like a video cassette case, but it is actually a mirror. It opens up to a normal mirror on one side and a magnifying mirror on the other. Whenever I get a new supply of Coke, an eight ball a day, I pour it into this mirror case and put it on the floor under the desk in front of my feet. During working hours, I duck under to snort up my cocaine. It's all in a pile. I'm not even bothering to cut into lines any longer. Late at night when no one is around, I just open it up on the desk beside my computer and snort away as I like. I have one mission, finish the book and check myself in. Nothing else matters. I am too damn sick to do anything else. And so it goes. Everything happens very quickly after that. My life becomes very small. I write. I do coke. I call friends occasionally. I go back to my apartment when I need to. I order up Chinese noodle soup and Texas barbecue sandwiches that I do not eat. So the cartons of fried rice with dents in the spots where I've picked it at it with my plastic fork amass on the floor. There are empty styrofoam cups of coffee and tea everywhere. Piles of books about biblical villainesses and, and magazines over a decade old. I have the Rolling Stone with Madonna's first cover from 1985 are tossed about almost as if in deliberate disarray. My editor tells me that the office is starting to look like an installation at the Whitney Museum. The head of publicity comes by to say hello one day and to get a look at the now legendary collage I've got going on the floor. She brings the art director in to see and they decide that they should photograph me lying in my mess and use it in the press packet. I quickly become a fixture in the building. The dealers deliver my coke to me in the lobby and the security guards call me to come down and pick it up. I get to know everyone who works in maintenance at the Bertelsmann compound and the men on the night shift let me in and out all the time as though I live here, which I do. Sometimes I go browse in the Virgin Megastore, which is open until 2 a.m. and I buy books and CDs that I'll probably never read or listen to. What are the chances I will get through even the first volume of Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in this lifetime? Do I really want the new live Fleetwood Mac album? There is a movie theater in the basement of Virgin and I see the ice storm and the sweet hereafter when I need a break. I snort coke with my coat over my head in the felt chairs and when I see Boogie Nights, I feel like I'm getting high in a group because Amber Waves slash Julianne Moore and Dirk Diggler slash Mark Wahlberg spend the whole movie getting wire too. None of the people in charge of Doubleday have, Double have any idea what to do with me or about me. They don't know how I came to reside in their office, and they can't figure out how they will ever get me to leave. <laughs> so they try to act normal. The publisher comes in one day to let me know that the writing and rewriting and revising and re-editing are getting out of hand. The book is probably done already. It's time to stop. He says, pencils down, as though I am taking the SATs and time is up. <laughs> The marketing director sometimes works on Saturdays, so he comes by to see how it's going. There's an editor who seems to always be around and sometimes will order up Chinese food together, which she, which she notices I do not eat. The copy editor is frequently making notations on my manuscript late, and he'll come by with queries about the wor my work in progress. I offer him some coke one night after hours, and he declines but asks to watch me do it since he's never seen that. 
Brendan, a Doubleday assistant, is a Bennington graduate, so of course he always wants to do coke with me. Um, sometimes I send him down to the lobby to do a pickup with my dealer when I'm in the midst of some deep thought on OJ and Nicole and can't be interrupted. I know all the janitors and cleaning women by name. Sometimes they do coke with me. It's like from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basily Frankweiler or Eloise in corporate headquarters. I think I am popular in the building. One day a bunch of people decide to use my office, my office and my bedroom for a meeting. Betsy warns me that I will have to clear out for a couple of hours. I say I will with much resentment. I decide to take a nap shortly before the appointed, to appointed time so a bunch of executives walk into the office and find me passed out on the day bed. I hear them walk in and I half wake up but I decide to play dead because I really am too tired to go anywhere else and sit up. They are so astonished by this person in grubby jeans slipping down her hips and a dust-dirtied Hanes t-shirt and a thick Shetland sweater draped over her like a blanket that they just leave and find somewhere else to meet. It is apparent that I have this whole publishing company codependent with me. <laughs> they should have Al-Anon meetings in the conference room. For a while, we go on like this. If I did not start having panic attacks with my throat constricting and my ability to breathe seriously impaired, we probably could go on like this for years. One day, one of the assistants hears me heaving in my office. She comes running in scared, ready to administer CPR. Through my heavy suspirations, I explain that this is nothing to worry about. I am just a drug addict having a panic attack, that's all. Betsy comes in every day, including weekends, to make sure I am not dead, which is ridiculous, since besides that I sometimes can't breathe, I am fine, and I am going to check into the hospital really soon anyway. She starts to cry. She says she is frightened. I tell her I am doing great. As soon as I finish my book, any day now, I will check in. What if you kill yourself before that, Betsy says, looking truly scared, though I think she is just being dramatic. Don't be crazy, I say. I'm not doing dope. You can't OD on cocaine. I'll be fine. When I'm ready to stop, I will. You can have a heart attack, Betsy says. I feel terrible about this. I feel like I'm letting you harm yourself by letting you work here. I don't sleep well at night. I don't see my kid because I'm here so much. I don't know how to tell you that I am sick to death and torn up. I'm afraid I will have, a, I will have blood on my hands. For God's sake, Betsy, just get over it. I don't actually roll my eyeballs, but I do metaphorically. You're overreacting. I can take care of myself. She starts to cry, and I don't know what to do. On a Sunday afternoon, a couple of days before I go to the hospital, I call Rob Bingham. I've just finished reading his collection of short stories, Pure Slaughter Value, which Doubleday published recently. Rob is an addict, too. He's had periods of being sober. His worst problem is drinking. But as far as I know, he is still in pretty deep. We're friends, not good friends, but he has a literary magazine called Open City, and he has huge parties whenever there is a new issue in his grand loft on White Street in Tribeca. Sometimes really late at night when only a few people are left, Rob and I have done heroin together on his pool table, or under his pool table, or in the kitchen, or the bathroom, or the bedroom, or any corner or any surface. Together we are scary. We can use long past the point when everyone else has passed out or gone home. He has a lot of friends who'll do drugs with him for fun, and I always think it enables him in some terrible, ugly way. None of my friends use with me. They know it's dangerous to encourage me. No one around Rob, except maybe his poor, long-suffering girlfriend, has any scruples or cares. I always say that the decadent people should be kept away from the desperate people. Rob and I are both desperate. Everyone else around him is just decadent. When I call him, it is four in the afternoon, and the phone wakes him up. I just want to tell you that the stories in your book are amazing, I say. I read a couple of them in The New Yorker a while ago, but all of them together are just graceful and disturbing. You're really good. I think you're the best fiction writer in our age group, you know, among our contemporaries. Thanks. Wow, that's good to hear, he says in a sleepy voice. That means a lot. I really need to read Prozac Nation. I know it's great. I just never got around to it. Don't worry about it, I reply. We talk for a few minutes about our publisher, about his editor, about the novel he's working on. Short story collections never sell that well, with rare exceptions, like Raymond Carver's stuff. But I bet his novel will do really well. I hope so. How's the book going, I ask, and then I think better of it. You should never ask a writer how his work is coming along. I hate it when people do it to me, and they do it all the time. You know, I'm, I'm working on it. It should be done soon, he says. 
He asks for my phone number so we can get together and hang out sometime. He's got it somewhere, but you know how it is, little pieces of paper scribbled on or information written on the back of a book. They all get misplaced in the mess. Then he says he's going back to sleep. Just two years from now, on Thanksgiving weekend of 1999, Rob will die of an overdose of heroin. He will be found dead in his bathroom by his wife, whom he had married just a few months before. His novel, Lightning on the Sun, about a drug deal gone terribly wrong, will be published posthumously. The end of the book, the main character is killed, assassination style, by some Cambodian guerrillas. On the last page, he digs his own grave. And anyway, I guess, well, um, did anyone have questions, or have I put you to sleep? <laughs> hey. There were so many points of irony. How much of that was in the moment, or, or do you find yourself having to insert that later? Um, I actually think I'm very aware of how silly things are right as they're happening. Um, which, uh, thank God, I mean, and, you know, I, I can't, um, I, um, I can't begin, I, this isn't, well, this sort of has something to do with it. I was, last weekend, I, I had, this past weekend, I had dinner with somebody who was on a spiritual quest and feels that the universe is giving him signs with everything, and he was, um, there's a point to this story. He was ordering a fillet of flounder, the kind that comes with a bone in it, and I said to him, you know, you really shouldn't order that, because even once you pull the bone out, there are lots of little bones in it. It's irritating to eat. You know, in truth, no matter how well you do this, it's just order something else. That's my suggestion. And so, you know, he did, and he said, I couldn't not take your suggestion because at that moment the whole universe was telling me to listen to you because the fact that you made this effort, that you thought about this thing and cared enough to, and I just looked at him and I said, it, it's flounder, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, you, you gotta like stop finding God in everything, you know? And, and um, I mean, and I think the point I'm trying to make is that that people are goofballs, um, most especially me, um, and that people who don't recognize that, like the guy who sees God in Flounder, um, are really scary, and that you, I mean, in some ways I think it impedes the ability to, I, I, I sometimes worry that it, it keeps, um, it, it might, keep me from being as honest as I should be, but I, th I think I, I really am. I mean, but what bothers me is that I sometimes think like when, I, when I've gotten, um, I've looked at bad reviews where I've thought that there was one thing where somebody said like something was inadvertently funny and I thought, oh my God, and you're inadvertently stupid. I mean, how, like, can, how could you not realize? I, I mean, I know what's going on and I, I mean, it's just so much of life is so silly, especially when you get into like one emotional mess after another. I, I mean, um, and you, you know, you, if you can't see, I, if I couldn't see these things at the time, I mean, I wouldn't have any friends. Like you'd have, no, there'd be no, nobody and nothing left. Um, I mean, I also, sometime after 9-11, I was on this NPR panel about, humor after 9-11 and um, it was me and the editor of The Onion and a few other people and I was saying and I said maybe this is just a Jewish thing but to me the worse things get the funnier they get like when things are really horrible that's like the the best time to start finding you know gallows humor or whatever I mean it, it's just and like the the funnier I think things are, the more of a sign it is that things are really horrible. I, I mean, it, it's kind of, um, I mean, that, that tends to be how I cope with things. So, 
um, you know, I guess that's. Elizabeth, what was the reaction of the people at Doubleday to your book? Um, you know, what's funny is they really did, they liked the book a lot, um, but that was a, a, that whole situation was really, really, really unfortunate because, <laughs> no kidding, but, um, but because it, it kind of, con it did end up alien, I mean, this is not, I don't know how many times my editor kind of came and said to me, look, you know, Pat Conroy is a serious alcoholic and his book has been in catalogs and we've like postponed it and let him go like dry out for three years and you know, you should check yourself in and then finish the book or whatever it was and you know, like kind of trying to say there, there's no, there, there would be no shame in doing that but um, I, I am um, deeply middle class I mean, I never, in the, uh, when I was in college, like, I probably should have taken time off given what was going on with me, and I never did because I felt like, oh, if I take time off, I get completely off the track, and then how will I get back on? And it was the same thing with this. I felt like I have to get the book done, and then I'll check in. And the, the thing was that, in the meanwhile, it I mean, really ended up alienating an awful lot of people there, or, or it didn't alienate them, but they felt really stressed out and tired before the business even began. And so um, the this problem also was that I did end up going to rehab and I, I, went, I stayed there for four months and I, I completely cleaned up and then the day I got out I used. And um, then I went on tour the next day and so I was if I had just been using on tour, that wouldn't have been so bad because then, you know, you've just given over to it. But I was trying not to use, so I would alternately be really buzzed and really exhausted. So it was a terrible tour. Um, and so the book itself really suffered. I mean, I, I, w I was not good at, I mean, the, it got a lot of attention and the attention was really misused. So just everything suffered. And, um, you know, they were, they were right to feel like, you know, they were definitely not happy and they were right to be not, I mean, that was just my fault. I mean, that wasn't, they didn't do anything wrong. Um, but there are other things that they did do wrong that I wish I had been, um, you know, on this planet to stop. Like the cover of the book, um, I mean, I don't have it here, but it's it's one of me, um, you know, topless, and I I really hated it. I hated it from minute one. I thought it missed the point, and I said at first that I hated it, and I think it really ended up di um, distracting people from the point of the book. I, I had no problem with me being on the cover of the book, but I had a problem with that picture. And, but mainly because I just didn't like the picture. It wasn't, it wasn't me. I mean, I, I, I am not that person. I'm not, it was like me, I mean, I'm not this person. I, I'm not like that. I, I'm a little bit more of a soft touch. So it just, it, it got it all wrong. But I was too fucked up. Like when people said to me, oh really, it's the best idea. Everyone loves it. I just was like, oh, whatever. And, by the time the paperback came out, I was like, absolutely not, N no, no, no. But, you know, so there were things that it, that, that, you know, they definitely misunderstood what was going on, and so there were problems like that, but it was just a really, it, it's not a good idea to go through a, a book publishing thing while trying to get clean. I'm. I mean, I don't think it's the worst thing to be on drugs or off drugs, but to be in the midst of recovery is a very bad idea. So, um, y you know, cause, and just to have imposed that much on all of them, it just w was not a good, y y you know. Um, it was funny at the time. It's really funny to look back on 
really funny. But, um, you know, if only because it's just back to like, you don't want to have bad relationships with people. It, it, you know. But what about more and again? I mean, what was their, really their reaction to that after this all came out? I have no idea. Oh, really? I, I mean, I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're fine because I haven't heard anything. But I, I still talk. I mean, I talk to the publicist. You know, everybody in New York publishing moves around all the time. Everyone knows each other. I mean, I, I think they're fine. You know, I think I think it's a funny story that <laughs> that you know, I think it's fine. So, um, yeah. If you're no longer addicted, what are you going to write about? Um, the, the truth is I actually am uh, going through this thing now where I uh, have this feel that I have wasted my whole life. Um, and I think that's not quite true. But um, I, I really, at one time, I was a reporter. And I was a good reporter because um, um, I made people feel like they could tell me anything, which they could, you know. And um, I, my next plan is actually, believe it or not, to go um, to the Middle East and, <laughs> and write about that. Um, I mean, that's become really an obsession for me. And uh, I, um, there's a particular story that's going on with one of the settlements there that has both a personal element for me and also is a, obviously everything there is a bigger story and um, it's very hard when I talk to editors now and say I want to write about this and they're like what do you know about the Middle East and I just that's what I studied I mean I know a lot I, I always want to say well more than you but um, I, I mean and, it, and it's and that's that's true. I don't know more than them about, you know, the former Soviet Union or whatever it is. But I mean, I, I, I speak perfect Hebrew. I, I am very, you know, I like probably more than most people who are even covering the area because I really know the history. And it drives me crazy reading. I, I mean, I've become one of those people who like sits and reads the internet all night and reads like, what are they saying in The Guardian in England? What are they, you know, and I get obsessed with like, you know, this is anti-Semitic, this is, I mean, and it's, it absolutely drives me crazy. And I feel like, well, obviously, the energy that I've put into being driven crazy that no one knew about or understood depression, there must be some way to use that to, I, I, I do, I, what can I say? I feel like it's strangely enough, even with the Middle East and with all the people that have descended upon there, there's still some lack of a, of a human perspective that maybe I, I could get. But besides that, in general, I want to go back to reporting. I'm really sick of myself. Um, and I, and there, that old, I think that also it's a very sad thing that new journalism has died. Um, you know, that was a really wonderful invention. Um, the, the thing about magazine writing now is that magazines, which at one time were writer-driven, are now ed editor-driven. Um, and I think, it, I think magazines uh, have, are, suffer for this. Um, very little, you know, once upon a time they would think, we're going to send a war correspondent to cover the Paris fashion shows, because like, you know, won't that be funny? Uh, there was some, there was some idea that like, you know, a great piece of writing, and there, there's still magazines that try to work on that principle, but a lot of it is like, we'd like a story on older women dating younger men. It doesn't really matter who writes it. We just got to get the story done. And um, there, there are like shifts away from it. At like a, a time will have, you know, a Roger Rosenblatt writing for them because they want to have voices. So it's, it, it's not consistent. But on the whole, like except for, you know, the New Yorker, a lot of magazines that, you know, used to really have that kind of new journalism thing don't have it so much. But I, I, think, it's, I think it's a loss. And I think that it, that's something that I really would like to do and would be 
you know, good at where you're sort of the reporter as part of the story, but you're still reporting. Um, and uh, I think uh, that would be, if you see what I mean, I think having written a lot about oneself, you could make use of that and that kind of writing. But I don't know. I'm not sure. Hey, I just wanted to ask you about the film of Prozac Nation. Um, I mean, I know at the time, well, I read at the time that you said you were going to be deeply involved in it. And then, well, that if anybody screwed up, you had to be involved in it. Because if anybody screwed it up, you were going to get really mad. And um, I mean, I know I when it came the out. The thing I said was that I would shoot them. Yeah, something, it was something like that. I didn't want to say it. But um, <laughs> when it came out at Toronto, um, like, this is just a personal thing. But I didn't find it as funny as I thought I was going to oh, do. You saw it? I did see it. And I didn't find it as funny as I thought I was going to do. And I just wondered what you thought about it and why it hasn't like come out yet. I mean, are the, I know they remade scenes afterwards. But. Well, it's very, the sad thing about the movie is it was basically made by a lot of kind of humorless Scandinavians. And <laughs> I just, and like, dare I say, like there are just no Jews involved at the, at the, I mean, no, the book is funny and I'm funny. And you just do not get that in the movie. I mean, it's like, it's just, it's a perpetual downer. I mean, I sat and wept through it. I thought, I think it's a, I thought it was a good movie. Um, I think its commercial potential is like nil. And I think, that unfortunately the, the director who is talented is not talented enough um, because it didn't have any subtlety. Like he isn't, was not talented enough to have it, had, the subtlety it takes to make something that's very sad also very funny is, you know, you, need a, you really need a great director to do that. I don't know that any great directors were interested in doing this. It was Eric, um, I can't say Schultberg. his name. Yeah, I thought you were having somebody else direct that, like a friend of yours, but... Um, I have nothing, I had nothing to do with it. I don't, I don't know, because <laughs> I, mean, I thought you were going to do, and then you, you didn't. But I mean, it's not a bad film or anything, but... No, it's I a good, it is it a good movie. I just thought it would be funnier, but I was just wondering what you thought about, like, say somebody came up to you for more now again, I mean, would oh you God. write the screenplay, or uh, would you just, no, wait? <laughs> oh, with more now again, I'm, I have complete control. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's n nothing's happening without me saying yes to everything, every step of the way. There's no way I'm ever letting anything like this happen again. Because it's actually, it is a good movie. I mean, if it, when it comes out, which is sometime, I think, in January, they, they re, um, I mean, Miramax is distributing it, and they did decide that they needed to, one thing they did do was they put in um, voiceover, and all the voiceover apparently is taken out of the book. You know, what can I say? They had some good sense. Um, you know, and they added in voiceover. They did add in some other scenes. I mean, I think they're try they are trying to make it more accessible. Um, so I, I, I don't really know the details of, like, what they're doing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really that much in the loop. But, um, but if with more now, again, like, the, the notion that, it, it would get so far afield from what, I, I mean, I, and the funny thing is, I've gotten to be very close with the director, the producer, I like them. I've had to teach the director, who is Norwegian, how to laugh at a joke, how to know if a joke is, I've explained to him the structure of a joke, like what, you know, that like the, t the typical thing is like that, you, the, what makes something funny is that as stupid as like the original person is, the punchline is that they're, the, that they're even stupider than you thought in the first place or whatever. I mean, I've tried to explain to him how humor works. I'm not kidding. Like he's so, 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 so serious. And I mean, I really, really like him and we really are friends. Um, I never want him to get near a single thing I write ever again. I mean, it's so, so serious. Um, the one amazing, amazing thing in the movie, and I, if you saw it, I think you'll agree, is Jessica Lang playing my extremely Jewish mother is so good. And my guess is that, because she's such a kind of old pro, she probably said to the director, like, you need to give me some more dialogue, some more character development. You need to make me less of a cipher here. Um, 
because somehow this, you know, kind of shiksa goddess is completely believable as, do, do you know? I thought Christina Ricci was really good too. Actually, yeah, she's. Oh no, Christina Ricci. Is I thought she actually looked like you. <laughs> yeah, film. no, Christina Ricci is great, but it's like not. I didn't think that was a surprise. Yeah. Like Jessica Lange is a is a really big surprise, and I I don't know. It's it's no. It's a. I think it's worth seeing. I I just um. You know, I'm I'm um, I mean I'm gonna I I'm, I'm totally in support of it. I, I think it I think it's a good movie. It's not the movie I would have made. But I, I, you know, but it is a good movie. If you want to, like, spend, you know, two hours honestly really crying, it really is, it's relentless. In the, in the downward spiral, it's relentless. There's no break. There's no moment of relief. There's no moment of, like, a- am I right? Yeah? It's like it's not funny for a second. There... There's not like a kind of a break in the, you know, which in a way is an achievement. I, I, I mean, but that's two hours of your life that you can't get back. Um, so I don't know. Or, Anyway, th- uh, really, thank you all so much. Everyone has been so nice. I, I really want to thank Bob and Mary and Peg and everyone who has organized this and has been so incredibly kind. You, you know, and everyone has been great. The 2002 Writers Conference at Southampton College 